Welcome to Behind the Book. It's time now for Behind the Book. Hosted by Tess Thompson and Karen McQuestion. Two authors with a passion for books, no filters, and limitless curiosity. Join them now to find out the real story behind your favorite books and authors. And now, Behind the Book. Hey, everybody. Here we are, another week of Behind the Book. I'm here with my co-host, Karen, and we have a really fun guest to share with you today, someone that I am personal friends with, um, having met her at Nink, like Karen did Grace, which she shared with you guys last week. So anyway, what, what did you think about our interview with Judy? Oh, that was fun. She uh, had a lot to say about her writing process, which I really appreciated. And I think both readers and aspiring writers will get a lot out of her interview. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, when we spoke last week, you said you were through the first 30% of your new book. How's that going? You know, it's now I've uh, laid the tracks and I'm moving forward and it's starting to be really fun. Um, the book that I'm working on, the tight, the working title is The House Sitter. And um, I, you know, it's funny because I said, I had a breakthrough because I had been a little stuck. And my younger son, his name is Jack, said, let me guess, you started another chapter from a different character's point of view. And I said, well, yes, that's exactly what I did. He said, you know, whenever you get stuck, that's what you do. And I guess I'm predictable and I didn't know. That's but so um, I always think that I'm doing a terrible job and people are going to hate, you know, hate the book or, you know, I, I just... Apparently, we're creatures of habit when it comes to writing books. We just don't know it. It feels new every time. Yeah, that is definitely true. I uh, I had the the blank page this week, and you know the once upon a time, and I think every time I don't know if I can remember how to start, but then you just do it, and it all works itself out. Now you were going on your road trip the last time we talked. And you yes. were going to meet up with um, our current guest, Judith Keim, in person. How did that visit go? Oh, that was so much fun. As I said, we'd met before at Nink, and then last year we did a project with some other ladies, um, some other romantic fiction writers, and we just became really good friends. We bond because both of us have issues with technology. <laughs> we, we always <laughs> are like messaging each other. Do you know how to do such and such? Um, but anyway, I got to see her. We spent a whole day together, um, Cliff and I and her husband, Peter. And they took us all over Boise, which we fell in love with. We really, it's on the top of the list, actually, of places that we liked the best. Um, and we went to, we, they're foodies like we are. And we went to this wonderful Italian restaurant where they made these homemade pasta. It was like melted in your mouth. It was so good. <laughs> but anyway, we had a great day and, um, she and I spent quite a bit of time talking shop, uh, before we hooked up with the guys. So that was always, that's always fun. One thing that I really took out of the interview with Judy is how encouraging she was to new or aspiring writers. I thought she had a lot of good, great tips and just a kind of a general, you know, don't give up, just keep writing from your heart. All those things uh, that I think are really important for people to hear, especially when they're feeling discouraged. Another thing she mentioned is how um, helpful writers are in a community of writers. You would think that we're competing with each other, but that's not really the case. I think most of them that I've met are um, more than helpful to give you little tips or tell them what, you know, what worked for them. And I love that about other authors. You see that more often than not. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's, I've said this before to my husband that books are not like other businesses where somebody chooses an apple over a banana. This is, they love books they read a great one. They want another great one. So there's mm -hmm. always another opportunity to find a new reader through an author's recommendation. So I love that, that people are so willing to, to do that for each other in this business. And Judith has written with 30 plus books, but for somebody who's a big reader, you know, they're going to be looking for more books like hers. So if she can steer you to another mm -hmm. author, it's all the better for everybody which I think is so nice. Hi, 
everybody. Welcome to another Saturday with Tess and Karen. We're super excited because we have Judith Keim here with us today. And I have the pleasure of being a personal friend of the famous Judith Keim. So I feel pretty cool. <laughs> we, we got to hang out together last uh, weekend in Boise, where she and her husband, Peter, have a beautiful home in a beautiful neighborhood that I'm coveting. Uh, and we had a great time talking about books and learning things from each other. Judith grew up reading and listening to stories, um, so I'm sure she'll be able to share some of her childhood memories with us about her love of books. Uh, but she writes women with heart, and I personally am a huge fan, and I love how her characters are both strong but vulnerable. And I'm sure she can share some of her tips about how she does that with us later. But we're going to jump into the questions. Uh, welcome, Judy. Thank you so much. It's so fun to be here. You know, I, I love you guys, love your books. So it just feels like, as you said, we're sitting down and just chatting for fun. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. So I want to know how old were you when you decided you wanted to become a writer? I don't think it was a conscious decision. I just have always read and always have written. I know when I was in eighth grade, my English teacher really encouraged me to write. But I think I've always sort of known that, writing little stories and things like most authors do. I noticed um, you have a lot of books that you've published within a short period of time, the last like maybe five to 10 years. Did you come to writing a little later or when did you uh, first well, publish? I wanted to come to writing much earlier than I did. Um, because I was writing and submitting for quite a few years. And I think, honestly, it was because I write romantic women's fiction. And until the last few years, that wasn't really recognized. I think, you know, they would like the story, but it didn't fit what the publisher exactly wanted. So um, when I tried writing and publishing on my own, I thought, well... I, I will try. And then lo and behold, people liked my writing. So I put up more of my books, which I had already written and set aside because one of the things they tell you when you're facing disappointment is keep writing. Mm -hmm. And I did. So I was able to get a lot of books out. And in the meantime, when I realized people liked my writing, I was sitting home writing and writing and writing more, more books. And Lake Union, you know, approached me and I did a couple of books with them, but I really am enjoying the fact that I'm in control of my own books, my own book covers, how I approach everything. And certainly it allows you to get more books out more quickly. Yeah, there's nothing like creative control. <laughs> so, you have got it, right? Mm hmm so how many books have you written so far? Do you have a favorite among them? Well, I've written more than are out, but right now I think 30 are out. I have some already written and in the background, my 2022 schedule is already set. So I'm beginning another series that will come out in 2023 and having fun with that. I, I think I'll, I'll turn the question around to you. Karen, do you have a favorite book out of all your book babies? <laughs> you know, I've, that's a common question that authors get. And I often hear authors say it's like choosing among your children or your pets. And that's absolutely a, a spot on analogy. No, I had some that were more fun to write, but ultimately I enjoyed writing them and, and love them all. So, or hope that readers love them. So, yeah, I think that's the case. Yeah, I love to think of books in terms of my characters because they are character driven. But I think out of all my books, to answer your question, I think Rhonda in the Beach House Hotel series is certainly among my favorite. Well, that's a great segue because I wanted to ask you about the beach as a setting. Um, I know that you enjoy putting your characters there on the beach. Um, why do you think that's such a popular location in fiction? Because I think when people go to the beach, they go with the intent of relaxing and enjoying. And so it's a, a perfect natural setting. 
And <laughs> I'll tell you a story. I grew up in upstate New York. And I say, even then, as a young child, I knew there was a better way to live because mm-hmm. I love being at the beach and I uh, had the warmer weather. So um, for me, and my husband and I have lived in Florida. Actually, we lived there twice in all of our travels. And um, actually, we're married and lived in Puerto Rico to begin our time together. And um, I, I like that setting. It's natural and it's um, because I like it so much, I think it comes through. So you've actually lived on the beach at times? Yes. Oh, well, that makes sense. Yes. And it's, an, it's a nice way to, to live. Although having traveled throughout the country, and I think, Tess, you found this on your latest, latest trip, this country is so beautiful. And every location has its own special things about it. Yeah, that is so true. And Judy's referencing my husband and I just did a two-week road trip around the Pacific Northwest. And everywhere we went, I just shook my head thinking, what a wonderful country we live in. So I completely agree. Um, All right, Judy, kind of uh, switching directions here. If someone is unfamiliar with your books, which one should they start with? The first series I wrote was The Heart of Women. And The Talking Tree is the first book in that series. and, And people like it. But I think the one that is getting the most attention is Breakfast at the Beach House Hotel. And after years of people begging, I finally have come out with the fifth story. And next year, there will be a sixth. So Judith, I would love to hear what your writing process is like, Um, how you go about it, if you set word goals, do you plot things out? Share that with us, if you would. Well, in, in the morning when I get up, I take care of the dogs. I come into the office and analyze what is going on. I go through my emails. I look at my numbers. So I get a sense of where I am that day. And then when I begin to write, um, I usually give myself, I, I tell myself, I have to write a thousand words per day. It used to be more, but, uh, With the time that we all have to devote to social media, uh, it does cut into writing time. And I'm trying to give myself a break and stop maybe at three or four in the afternoon. But again, I'm happy to take part in in talks in the evening or, or whatever is required. But I'm definitely a pantser. When I sit down to write a book or tell my friends, hey, I'm starting a new book, they laugh and say, no, Judy, we know it's going to end up to be three books at least. So when I sit down to start, I usually start then with three main female characters in mind. I have a location. One of the things that I really like to do when I start a book is have a title. And if I know that... the what the series is going to be about, I really like to have book covers made because seeing the book cover really prompts me to complete the work I set out to do. I love book covers and it's just something I like to do. So I get started. I don't always know where I'm going, uh, but as I begin the first book, I'm also setting the storylines for the second and third book through those characters. Some people don't like to do that. I I find it more interesting to do it that way. What about on those days when you're not feeling the muse? What do you do then? (laughs) Well, sometimes I take a drive, I take a walk. Hot showers are just great ways to come up with something. And if I'm lucky lucky enough to lay in bed for a few minutes, I can sometimes do my plotting then if I'm the one awake and everybody else is asleep. It's hard on those days. I don't know. What do you guys do? Sometimes I uh, do what you talked about. And uh, sometimes I, when I go to sleep at night, I tell my brain to work on it. And sometimes (laughs) in the morning I've come up with something. How about you, Tess? Uh, yeah, the stuff that Judy said for sure. Um, and I'm, I have this thing where I wake up in the middle of the night all the time 
And so a lot of times I'll think through plot issues or think about, okay, what scene do I want to write tomorrow? Um, but my other trick is I listen to music sometimes just to something that I really like that's emotional to me that sometimes will prompt something or get me kind of more in the creative mood. I think the worst of all is the middle because I am a pantser. I get them to a certain spot and think, what am I going to do next? And <laughs> it can go in a lot of different directions. Well, and that's a perfect lead into our next question, which is asking if you have any doubts about a book, um, either while you're writing it or after you finish it. Oh, my goodness. When I get to the middle and don't know where I'm going, it really makes me wonder if I'm doing a good job. And then by the time I get through the book, and I'm terrible with names. I mean, I can change a character's name two or three times. And my husband is one of my editors. <laughs> and he helps me out. But by the time I get to the end of every book, I say to him, I don't think anybody's going to like it. I think it's dumb. And he says, Judy, you always say this. And they always like your books. <laughs> Yeah, Judy and I have several things in common, and one of them is forgetting the character. It's always a minor character, but I just got an edit, edit back like a couple weeks ago, and my editor said, who's Mindy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, can I relate? I once changed the dog's name halfway through the book and forgot to go back and change it. Oh, thank God for editors is what I say. Exactly. Um, Oftentimes right, when I well, start a book, um, I do change a character's name. I'll start out with one character, and then as I add to them, I realize the name is wrong for that character. Yeah, I just heard a, um, a it was a talk about writing with Judy Bloom, and she was talking about names and that um, she often will start out with something and then realize, oh, that's completely the wrong name for this person. After you get to know the characters a little bit better, sometimes things are more obvious. Exactly. Um, all right, so how do you know when a book is done? When there's no more to be said that has to be said. It's interesting because people are reading shorter books, and I, I am now writing books that are seventy-five to 80,000 words. But remember, when we started, I mean, it was really more ninety-five to 100,000 words. And people... Um, I think are busier and don't have that kind of time and are satisfied with books as long as they meet the requirements of, a, in our case, my case, a happy ending and having all those threads resolved in the book. And sometimes it's almost like an intuitive thing. It feels final to you. It feels finished, I think. Yes. I was wondering, and I love to ask um, authors this, what is the why when it comes to your fiction? What are you hoping that readers will take from your books? Probably the fact that women are strong. Women help one another. Families are everything. And I personally want everybody to be happy and to be loved. I love that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, get a little teary-eyed over here. All right, so tell us a little bit about your latest release and what inspired it. Tell us a little bit for anybody who hasn't read it yet. Tell us a little bit about it. Okay. A, a Road Trip to Remember is one of my seashell cottage books. And these are all standalone books that take place in, at, in some part of the book at the seashell cottage on the Gulf Coast of Florida. So I love the idea of different stories in the same location. And I always mention the Salty Key Inn, which is nearby the Seashell Cottage. And for readers who have read my sea Salty Key Inn series, they love that. So that makes it fun too. And A Road Trip to Remember was one of my favorite stories to write because I love the main character in the book. After being sort of forced into a retirement complex, she decides that she is going to take a road trip to Florida. And she has arranged to meet friends along the way, her old college uh, friends. 
And the main purpose of her trip is to meet up with her, the man that she thought she was going to marry. She talks her granddaughter Blythe into taking her because she isn't able to drive. Blythe has just gotten into another confrontation with her stepmother. And her stepmother, her father, and her two stepbrothers are going to Hawaii on a three-week vacation. So Aggie and Blythe take off, hoping they won't get caught. And it is an endearing story because she does meet up with her old friends. And of course, she meets up with Donovan. And she and Donovan have a wonderful time. Their relationship was sort of doomed by her not getting a letter that he had sent her. And so it's only right that after all these years, they're able to be together. But there are lots of tricks and surprises in this story. So I'm not going to say much more than that. And both Blythe and Aggie realize all the things that they've always wanted. I was wondering what, um, as far as being an author is, what have you found to be the most gratifying part of the job? I think like, like many authors, I think when people write to you and tell you how much the story has meant to them, it's very, very touching. Knowing that you made a difference in people's <clears throat> lives, I think that's ex- yes. exactly what you said. Yes. Yes. So who has been your biggest supporter, both for working on your craft and then after you were published? Well, I would have to say Peter, my husband, has been. And gosh, I've had other people in the family. And I have to say, the author community is really supportive of one another. You have down days. You have doubts. You wonder if you've done the right thing, if you're doing the right thing. Is the book stupid? Is, you know, on and on. And author friends support you. And that's very untrue in many businesses. Yeah, definitely. Well, speaking of uh, something kind of unique to the author community that I have found, and I go to these conferences and I meet these women who have done so well for themselves and, you know, as indie writers, especially, and they've, you know, they're making wonderful salaries and livings and, and they are able to assist their husband in an early retirement or in a retirement. And then the husband comes and works in partnership with the author. So I know, Judy, that that's your situation. And I'd love to hear more about that. I just think that's so, (laughs) so cool. Well, it is cool when your spouse can help out. It is not without a few trials and tribulations. However, I have to be honest. (laughs) But it really means that you can move things quickly, be hands-on, get resolution to, to problems more quickly. And of course, you have that support. And it's interesting because Peter is a wonderful editor, but he's not a content editor. As he says, you know, to read one of Judy's stories, I have to put on a dress. So, I mean, <laughs> so <laughs> you he can't always support all of it, but I can raise certain um, story questions or plot ideas. And he'll let me know quickly if he doesn't think it's a good idea, but he sometimes can't add to it. But just having that quick, knowledgeable response is very helpful because, again, I'm a pantser and I don't always know where I'm going. So for someone who's just starting out, um, maybe an author who's still working on their first book or just published their first book, what advice would you have for them? Well, you always hear never give up because the process is painful. There's no other way to describe it. Even when you're doing well, you know, self doubt and worry about things. For me, the worry of trying to keep up with the social media aspect is daunting sometimes. I I love my readers. I love being in touch with them. But the other aspect, the numbers aspect and so on, is not comfortable for me. But for a brand new reader starting out, I think you have to write with your heart. You listen to other people 
and what they say and what help they offer. Because even when you don't want to hear that maybe there's a better way to do things, most, most people, as we had said in the author community, are making suggestions from a sense of help, not hurt. Yeah, I would agree absolutely. With that. Yeah. Has there ever been anything else you've wanted to do besides be a writer? Did you have a, a secret career we don't know about from your past? Well, interesting. I was, um, I served on a board for the foster care system in Florida. We were trained heavily so that we could sit in place of a judge to hear certain cases within the system. And you know, the law is the law, so you would hear cases, but you'd have to abide by the law and so on. But if I were young and maybe starting all over again, uh, family law might be of interest. But basically, in this life, I'm, I this is the best job I've ever had. And when you um, go to work in the morning, when you start writing, do you have a specific space that you write? Do you have a home office or? I'm lucky enough to have a home office. Our home is small. It's like a three bedroom condo, only it's a house with a a nice yard and a three three car garage, which is very important (laughs) to my husband. (laughs) And um, so in this small space, I have my own office. And across the hall, Peter has his own office. So we can shout back and forth to one another. <laughs> or we have sometimes been known to email each other. But uh, <laughs> from across the hall, you email from across each other. The hall. That's funny. <laughs> but, we do um, a lot of texting in this house, so I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I feel very fortunate to have my own space. I I feel sorry for people who aren't able to do that. It helps, especially if you can close the door and just emotionally make the space as well. Exactly. So I know you have two grown sons. Do, does anyone in your family read your books besides Peter, obviously? Um, well, I have to tell you, my oldest son is a tugboat captain, and he does most of his work in Alaska. So when he's not up at the wheelhouse, he's obviously resting, and he does a lot of reading. So I got a phone call from him, gosh, a couple months ago, and he said, Mom, I've read your books. And it was the Beach House Hotel series. And I said, oh. And he said, and Mom, they're good. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, great. That makes me so happy. So he said, you know, they're not like what I thought. I mean, they're interesting because I, I, I wouldn't read romance. <laughs> <laughs> So he said, you know, they kept me wondering what was going to happen next. So, I mean, I was totally thrilled. So he has definitely read it. And then my nieces uh, have read my books. But but the guys, I mean, I, I understand, you know. <laughs> yeah. The they fact that your son was... Dresses to read my books. <laughs> <laughs> what, now, what kind of books do you enjoy reading when you're not writing or involved in your own projects? Actually, those books in my own genre. Oh, the really? Women's fiction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. More heartwarming women's fiction with happy endings. Exactly. Perfect. I mean, I do read other books, but at this point, like in the group that we're all in, I want to read everyone's books. So that'll take me a while. I love this question. What is something negative that somebody said to you that made you want to succeed even more? Probably a few years ago. Oh, and I know, oh, this, this happened fairly recently. Oh my gosh, I was in a, in a gathering and I hadn't seen this person for quite a while. And she said, so are you still, you know, working with your books sort of, I mean, that was a nice hobby. And I said, oh, well, as a matter of fact, you know, you have to be careful what you wish for because it's turned into a big business. And I know that <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, and little does she know that you have readers clamoring for more. Well, and, uh, it's far. Yeah, but it was honestly, it was just the way she said it was so dismissive. Oh, yeah. We've all heard that. And I can I remember. Be- yeah, I can remember before my first book came out, 
and people were asking, you know, were asking, oh, well, what are you up to? And I almost never admitted it yet. I was, I was like, oh, I'm home with the kids now or whatever, because, you know, you're just going to get that kind of, oh, the eye roll. Oh, you're writing a book. Isn't everybody? Yeah, I know. <laughs> when you go to sleep at night, do you ever have dreams or nightmares about writing or related to what you're working on? I don't have nightmares about it. Well, one of the reasons I ask is because if I don't write for a while, I start to get the same dream that I'm stuck in a house. And it's the weirdest thing. Oh, my gosh. So, and I'll be like, oh, that's because I'm in between books and I need to get back to work. I'm literally stuck. So you haven't had anything like that. No, but you know, I do, I do get itchy if, if, I'm not, if I'm not writing or thinking about the next book. I, I, I really don't like it. I, I like to keep busy and keep my mind active and I enjoy the creativity. So by, by itchy, do you mean like kind of that uneasy feeling like you should be doing something? Yes, I, I, I should be writing. And I went through a period recently, and I think maybe it was because of the pandemic, where I didn't, I didn't know what book I was going to write next. And I always have them kind of lined up, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I was thinking, holy cow, I'm, a, I don't, I'm not ready to stop. But finally... I had this idea, and and every time I do have an idea, a good solid thought about a book or a series, I do write it down so that I can go back to it later and look at it and think, is this does this make sense or not? Smart. I I'm sure I know the answer to this, but is there ever a day you think that you would want to stop writing? No, <laughs> no. When the time comes and I've gone on to another place, they can say, I wonder how she was going to end this book. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I have a pact with my youngest daughter that if I die unexpectedly, that nobody is allowed to see whatever the rough draft is that I was working on. (laughs) (laughs) So what are you working on right now, Judith? I'm working on book one of the Sanderling Cove series. And a grandmother invites her three granddaughters to come for the summer. Something has come up. Uh, They don't know what it is, but her lawyer has talked to her about who would run the bed and breakfast place that she has if something ever happens to her, that it's, it's time in her life to start thinking about these things. And the grandmother, who is just a a load of fun, doesn't really want to face it, but she needs to see if any of her granddaughters would be willing to take it over. And as it turns out, all three of them, two are 29 and one is 28, are at a period in their life where they want to make major changes. So they come together and all sorts of things are going to happen. I love how uh, you have characters of all different ages in your books. And I've heard other readers of your books say the same thing as well. Sometimes there's so much emphasis on people in their 20s and 30s, and you don't shy away from having characters in their 40s, 50s, 60s on up, which is, I think, wonderful. I love these older characters. I mean, they've been through it all, and they don't mind speaking their minds. (laughs) It's, It's a difference, as you say. Well, Judith, if you are ready... To wrap this up, we have a tradition here on Behind the Book where we ask 10 bonus questions. They're not writing related. They're just for fun. If you're willing to play along, I'll just ask the question and just whatever comes into mind, just blurt it out. Are you okay. are you up for this? Sure. Why not? Okay. The first one, what is one food that will never get past your lips? That's harder than it sounds because I'm a foodie. <laughs> Um, it would have to be something like grasshoppers or that type of thing. No fried crickets for you, huh? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Who would you want to play you in a movie? To play me now as a writer? Yes. Oh, boy. Now, that's a hard one. Um, nope. I don't think any movie star would want to play me. That's, that's <laughs> the thing. <laughs> well, I think about who would embody your personality. Probably Queen Latifah. Oh, I like that. I like that. That's awesome. I love her too. (laughs) 
Okay, here's one that probably won't be hard. What superpower would you pick given the opportunity? Wouldn't it be fun to fly? I would love to fly. Me too. At the end of your life, what do you hope you'll have accomplished? I hope to have accomplished to have made many people happy and for my family to treasure their memories of me. What is the worst job you've ever had? I worked for a a company as a secretary to one of the guys in a tech department at a big insurance companies. And one of the things I had to do was clean up after the lunches. And they would call me down to clean up the conference room and put away the food and everything. And I didn't like that. If you could instantly become an expert in something, what would it be? Probably Facebook ads. (laughs) (laughs) When you figure it out, let me know. (laughs) Uh, What is your favorite scent? Oh, the smell of garlic and lemon and good food cooking. Oh, you are a foodie. What is the most terrifying thing you've ever done? Oh, my gosh. Well, I spoke French in front of a group of French people when I was representing my hometown. That was brave. I don't think I would have done that. Such a bad (laughs) headache the whole time. How did it go? Did it go pretty well? Yeah, they they thought it was okay. (laughs) Okay, here's a good question. When people pronounce words incorrectly, do you let them know? Not not ordinary people, no. Maybe people in my family. And if you could live your life over again, would you want to? Yes. And I would do it differently, maybe. But not, oh. not too much. Not too much. That's a great answer. I think that wraps it up for today. Judith, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It was so much fun. And I'd love to get to be with you guys and have a laugh or two. So thank you so much for having me. And Judy, remind everybody where they can find you online. Everybody can find me on all all my books are on all sites, paper, ebook, and audible in iTunes. And so you can find me on any of those sites. I have my own website, judithkeim.com. And I'm on BookBub. You can find me there on Goodreads, Twitter, Facebook, of course. So, and as I said, I I love to hear from my readers and I consider many of them friends. All right. Well, thanks for being here. You're such a sport to join us. And um, hopefully you can come back and talk with us again next time you have a book out. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Behind the Book. Brought to you by authors Tess Thompson and Karen McQuestion. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and post a question in the comment section. This has been Behind the Book.